All right. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Hope everyone's doing well. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, and uh, pray, and then uh, we will uh, we will get started on Revelation chapter 17. Um, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Lord, thank you uh, so much for the opportunity for um, uh, us to be here um, um, and to learn from your scriptures, to understand the future, to be aware of it, um, to understand the hope that's found within this chapter and in the book of Revelation, and to uh, give us understanding and knowledge so that we may know comprehensively your desire, um, just not only in how we are to live, but to how we are to view uh, the world and the future. Pray, Lord, that uh, this would be an instructive time and uh, that overall you would be glorified uh, for it's in your son's name. Amen. Well, we are five chapters away from finishing this book. That doesn't mean that it's going to be short, right? But we are we are coming up to the last and final chapter of the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 17. Let's go ahead and review uh, what we discussed last week, um, just kind of briefly, and then uh, and then we will go from there. So a review from last week. We ended chapter 16 with the seven bowls of wrath. These are the last bowls to be explicated onto the world itself and dispensed. And we specifically took a, a um, um, special consideration for the seventh bowl and the effects of that particular bowl, the, uh, uh, the great earthquake, right? And on all of the details associated with it, that the, the great city is split into three parts. It's essentially decimated right, uh, uh, that Babylon is remembered by God and is given the full measure of the cup of the wrath of God. And then we talked about the hailstones, right, um, that uh, 75 to 100 pound hail uh, coming down and pulverizing individuals, um, specifically those who belong to the kingdom of the conqueror. Right. And even with all, all this, the chapter ends with man still slandering God. You know, you would think that uh, after, you know, all of this carnage, they would get the message. Um, but, you know, again, we talked about the uh, affect and the position of these individuals who are sold to the beast. They have given their lives to, to, for the sake of the beast. Right. It's very important. Let's go ahead and talk about chapter 17. I, I got to tell you, out of all of the chapters, and we've looked at some pretty difficult ones, right, over the course of time that, I've, that we've been studying this book together. Out of all of the chapters that I think that I've had the privilege of studying, this one, this one scares me the most. It, this one is challenging. It is difficult. Um, all right, uh, let me just go ahead and put this here. Uh oh, I think my batteries are dead. That's okay, though. The particular challenge with this chapter is it's heavy, heavy, like um, um, Marty McFly, heavy, right? It is heavy with imagery, it is heavy with details. It is heavy with aspect. I mean, this is this is this is a challenging chapter. Um, this may cause one to read this chapter to be confused about what's going on uh, here in this particular. Have you ever read chapter seventeen and went, okay, um, sure, we we know that it's going to happen. I just don't know what's going on, right? Um, so. In, in an attempt to try to make this as simple as possible, and, and, and not even, that's not even included all of the backloaded theology that we may bring to this chapter, right? So it's not like we come in flying blind, or, or it's not like we come in just and read the text, but we also have, you know, things that we've 
kind of read and picked up over the years and stuff like that that may influence how we view the chapter itself. Okay, so it's th that's even a challenge. My objective is to work from the macro to the micro. So we're going to look at big, huge details first and kind of what's going on. And then we're going to rewind back and then look at the minute details. I think it's important to kind of get a big picture aspect of what's going on and then and then see how those big picture things fit within the within the chapter. I think if we do that, if we move from the from kind of the universals to the particulars, I think we're able to understand this this chapter is like watching a cricket match. Right. I have no idea what's going on when I watch that. Right. There's like several things happening. But if you if you understand kind of the universals of cricket, it seems to make sense. That's what we're going to do here. OK. So here's some questions that we ought to ask this text. Who or what do the images in this chapter represent? If there's if it's heavy with imagery, what do who do these images in this chapter represent? Um, what are the aspects of time? There's about three, at least three aspects of time in this chapter, past, present, future, and then the add that this is a prophecy concerning the future. So there's several aspects of time here. And why, why do they matter? Why are they important in this chapter? Three, who is the great harlot? We will answer that question this morning. Okay. But that's important because that phrase is used here several times, and not only in chapter 17, but in 18 also. Okay. Who are the seven mountains or the seven kings in this chapter? Uh, there's some discussion and maybe even some debate still about who these do the, who these individuals are. And so we'll talk about that. And what is this chapter? Why is this chapter here in this part? I always like to ask this question because these the the details are not just written at random, right? There's a there's a specific reason why it, it's it's here and it wasn't earlier in the book of Revelation. Why is it here in this in this particular historical account? So we will kind of play with that question. Okay. Let's start by looking at the macro and then working to the micro. We will look at some of the details mentioned and the images that are associated with this chapter. First, it is the great harlot or the prostitute, which is mentioned in verses one and described in verses two and seven. We'll go ahead and read uh, uh, this part here. Actually, no, we'll, we'll skip that because we're actually gonna we're actually gonna read this later on. So we found we have the great harlot, the prostitute, mentioned in verse one, described in verses two and seven. We have the kings of the earth in verse two. Okay. And then we see another reference of the kings of the earth in verse 12. Okay. We have those who dwell on the earth in verse two. Now, we're already familiar with this particular phrase, right? Every time we see this phrase mentioned, it's usually referencing unbelievers, okay? So we're, we're pretty familiar with this. So we kind of know the, the individuals here in whom John is detailing. This, these individuals are described in verse two. We have the scarlet or the red beast, which is described in verse eight. So we got the great harlot, the kings of the earth, those who dwell on the earth, and the scarlet beast. Okay, these are four into four four groups already. Then we have the seven mountains, which is verse nine, and we have the explanation of what these mountains are. We don't have to guess 
what these are. The text tells us what these mountains are. Okay? That's verse 10. Then we have 10 horns and the explanation of the 10 horns in verse 12. Okay? Last, we have the lamb in verse 14 of this text here. And again, we are familiar with the lamb. Uh, we were introduced to this particular word in Revelation chapter 4, right? So we know who that, that lamb is, right? And then we have the waters, verse 15 and the explanation of those waters in verse 15. All of these things uh, are, again, our imagery. And notice here, whenever that we have an image, that image is explained. So we, again, we don't have to guess what these are. The text informs us what these images are and what they represent. And then we have, of course, God in verse 17. Okay? These are all of the details in a, in, a, in a macro level, okay? Again, heavy with imagery, but again, this, this, this chapter fortunately gives us some of the keys to understanding this text because, again, we don't have to guess what these are. John, by way of this messenger, gives us some of the explanation of this text here. Let's go ahead and uh, read Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 and following. And then uh, we will look at this text and begin to start to look at some of the, the, the micro. Then one of the seven angels who had had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So all right now we have uh, one of the divine messengers after the bowls have been poured, which is why this is one of the answers to why this text is here. Because it explains that one of the angels, one of the divine messengers who poured the bowls is getting ready to show John something. That's why it's not written earlier in the text. This involves one of the angels who pours the last seven bowls of the wrath of God. He's going to show John something. So uh, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of calamity came to John and said to him that he would show him the judgment of the great harlot. I want to talk about this word judgment. This word's krima. We talked about this in various aspects, used 27 times in the Greek scriptures. Um, it's used in several ways. It's used in a forensic sense, when we're, when, like a judgment in a courtroom. Okay, When one takes one to court um, to accuse them of something. Or it's used in an evaluative sense before God, which brings about condemnation and judgment. So right off the bat, this particular thing that we're going to walk through, this chapter that we're going to walk through, has to do with the judgment of the great harlot. Not only chapter 17, but chapter 18 too. Now again, as we've mentioned before, these chapters are kind of man-made. Right. So when you actually read a book, you read the whole thing. Right. Um, you, you know, the the addresses were kind of created for us to give us easy reference to know where we're going. Um, but this works as a whole unit. OK. So think of chapter 17 and chapter 18 as this one whole unit that describes the judgment of this so-called harlot, this great harlot. OK. The divine messenger is going to lay out the ultimate punishment of this great harlot. Now, we've already looked at this punishment 
from the great harlot in the last chapter, right? The, when he poured out the seventh bowl and there was an earthquake and the great and the and the and the great city split into three parts. So we've already seen a little bit of detail here. Now we're gonna take now the messenger is gonna take this timeline and expand it, right? So this message is completely about the harlot and, and the activity of the harlot and ultimately the destruction of this harlot. This chapter works in concert with the previous chapter, as I just mentioned before, concerning the seven bowls. In addition, this chapter focuses on the condemnation and the punishment of this harlot. Man, I, you're gonna hear the word harlot for a while. Whereas the previous chapter focused on the beast and those who took the mark of the beast, right? As in um, the, seven, the seven bowls and them mostly being about the judgment of those who took the mark of the beast in his kingdom, okay? Now the divine messenger gives the reasoning for this judgment of the great harlot. Okay, we find this um, in verses two. It says, he says, um, I'll start at verse one again. It says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here and I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed immorality. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So we see that uh, the judgment and the reasoning for this judgment, that all the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality or fornication, the word is poroneo. It is used eight times in the Greek scriptures and its most frequent use, interestingly enough, is used in the book of Revelation. Five times this word is used. Now, this word again carries with it the meaning that we have un, unsanctioned relations, sexual relations, right? Some of these things are described in various chapters in the scriptures. It is specifically used with unsexual sexual relations with another, specifically a prostitute. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians right quick. I want to look at this right quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll look at one instance, verse 18. I'll start at verse 15. It says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ. Again, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Shall then I take away the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot, of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit. Flee immorality or fornication, right? Every other sin that man commits is outside the body, but an immoral man commits it against his own, right? So uh, this particular uh, word is associated with that of harlotry or prostitution or in, or in our today's terms, sex work. But I digress. However, this word is also used in reference as an example to discuss idolatry. This is how God looks at idol worship, right? And the shameful doctrine that one adopts, he looks at it the same way he would look at harlotry. In, in Nahum, in the Old Testament, this is actually nothing new, right? Um, again, this is nothing new. In Nahum chapter 3, 
We're going all the way back to the Old Testament. Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 and following. Nahum, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes this. It says, Woe to the bloody city, completely full of lies and pillage. Her prey never departs. The noise of the whip, the noise of the rattling of the wheel, galloping horses and abounding chariots, horsemen charging, swords flashing, spears gleaming, Many stay in a mass of corpses and countless dead bodies. They stumble over dead, other dead bodies because of the many harlotries of the harlot, the charming one, the mistress of sorceries who sells nations by her harlotries and families by her sorceries. This is talking not about a particular person, but about a particular city. That that city's activity, because of the activity that's done within that city, is defined as immoral. Fornication. So this picture of this woman is this prostitute, this harlot. And then the messenger describes those who this great harlot has been committing acts of shame with, right? The kings of the earth or the kings of the land, right? Again, this phrase is used elsewhere in the book of Revelation. These are individuals that have power and influence, individuals who are ruling over regions, right? at that particular time. Let's look at where this word is used in other places. In Revelation chapter 18, verse three, we see this word mentioned. It says, for all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her fornication, of her immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. This is the charge, that the kings of the earth are in bed, figuratively speaking, with this great harlot. And they are profiting from this great harlot and off of this harlot. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 9, we see the same phrase here. And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. We will, we will get to that in short order. Okay? And lastly, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 19, we see the same phrase here. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army, right? This is the great second coming chapter, which we are again are approaching uh, uh, in short order here. So we see that this, this, this phrase that's used, harlotry and the kings of the earth are, in, are involved with this particular uh, uh, image of this prostitute. That those who dwell on the earth, that's the third category. That's everyone else, right? Again, we've seen this phrase elsewhere in the book of Revelation. We've seen it in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10, chapter 8, verse 13, chapter 11, verse 10. And chapter 13, verse 14, respectively. And every time this phrase is used, those who dwell on the land, it is specifically used in light of this book for unbelievers. Okay? And those who have taken the mark of the beast. So we have three categories here. The great harlot, which we have not described yet. We have the kings of the earth who is kind of uh, with their acts formal cabutilating with the harlot, 
And then we have the, the everyone else, those who dwell on the earth, right? The unbelievers. We get an interesting phrase here in verse 3. John carried me away in spirit. Don't be afraid about that. That just means that uh, he was carried away in spirit. That's it. Okay. We've seen this before. Into the wilderness by the divine messenger to observe this particular harlot. John gives the details as to the look, the imagery of this harlot. And she is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, regal, right? So she's sitting on a scarlet beast. And we see that the scarlet beast has seven heads and ten horns. We see this in verse 3. And he carried me away in spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, slanderous names, right? Having seven heads and ten horns. This is verse 3. We see her attire mentioned here. He's given us all, this, all the details here, John is. Verse 4. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a full cup of the abomination and unclean things. So she is she is externally pretty. I mean, she's got the she's got the she's got the uh, the the, um, the the Dolce Gabbana, right? She's got the coach bag, right? You know, I mean, she's got she's got the juicy couture, you know, I mean, I mean, she's got the Michael Kors. I mean, she's she's decked out, man. OK. She's got the gold. She's got the silver. She's got the purple. She's got the scarlet. She's got the precious stones. She is prosperous, man. OK. I have uh, other comments, but I'll keep them to myself. Okay. She has an object in her hand, and this is a gold cup full of abominations and unclean things of her immorality. These are this this is a gold cup that she holds. She's she's proud of it, man. She's got she's got everything. She's got the gold, she's got the jewels, she's got the she's got everything, man. And she's holding this high. This is a this is a proud image. This is not, even though the, the, the image is shameful, okay, it is proud. Riches, power, influence, all of this is seen in this imagery here, okay? Then we see what's written on her forehead. John describes this. And on her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, or mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. Now we get a description of who this is, right? On the forehead, this is usually, uh, uh, gives this away here. It's not written on her thigh. It's not written on her arm. It's not written on her chest. It's written on her head. You can see it clearly. Right. This mystery is now Babylon. We see this now. This woman represents this city. This is the third time Babylon is used in the book of Revelation. The first time was in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7 and 8. Says, and he says with a loud voice, this is one of the woes, right? Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and earth and sea and the springs and waters. And another angel, a second one follows saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. They're, they're announcing this, this, this messenger is announcing this, right? We spent some time talking about Babylon, the area, the region, the power, the influence, right? We talked about this. Babylon the great, she who has made, she who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality, all the way back in Revelation 14. Babylon was uh was making the rounds, right? 
In Revelation chapter 16, verses 18 and following, the previous chapter before, we've seen this. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since men came to be on the earth. And so great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The city was split into three parts, and the city of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. So we have Babylon who's holding a gold cup of all her immoralities and things like that. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that God says here by John that he's going to give her a cup of his wrath, right? The influence of this, of this city is immense, widespread, influential, tentacles everywhere, right? Perhaps even a superpower of the world at this particular time. Babylon rises from the ashes to be influential. This word is always refers to this city, literally, normally, plainly. We're not talking about the spirit of Babylon, we're not talking about the essence of Babylon, we're not talking about the, the, you know, you get the picture. This is always referring to the city, this region, and this area, okay? So the image of Babylon itself is personified. This is a personification as a harlot. Harlots were not looked at as honorable members of society, unlike today. They are shameful people. They will take on whoever. They don't honor marriages. They don't honor people. They don't honor anything. The name on her forehead also is that she is the source of all idolatry. Babylon will become the central focal hub for all this activity. And all of the detestable things, why she has a cup full of it, that's why it's on her forehead. And make no mistake about it, she will be prosperous. All right? John then writes about the activity of this city concerning the saints in verse 6. It says, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Mythos or mytho, myth, mythio is the word here. Drunk, intoxicated, woozy, right? That's kind of the idea. Uh, inebriated. And the source of her inebriation is the blood of the saints. She's overindulged in this. The, the word is used of the activity of Babylon overindulging in the murder of the saints of the faith. They would perhaps bringing them into the city, maybe putting them on stands, impaling them, you know, executing them, using them for sport, things like that. Just detestable stuff. We haven't even talked to, I mean, that's, that's even concerning the conqueror too. So we have all this activity of the saints being pursued, not just by the conqueror, but by Babylon. And they're brought in, and there you go. In verse, <laughs> in verse 7, uh, or verse 6, uh, it says, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood and with the, uh, uh, with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus, right? When I saw her, I wondered greatly, okay? Uh, this phrase, it's like John doesn't have any words for what he sees here. He's looking at this, and I guess a more, more common phrase would be, what the heck is that? <laughs> he's, he's marveling, like, I have no, what is this? I, I, I have no idea what right? He wondered greatly. And of course, the 
messenger seeing his response this is kind of comedic why do you wonder <laughs> why are you so shocked right that's verse seven and the angel said to me why do you wonder right he goes, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which is seven heads and ten horns. The divine messenger, it seemed, would tell him the mystery. This is the same word in verse five, the word mysterion, right? In other words, you don't have to worry about that, John. I'm going to tell you what this is, right? You already have some of the information. You know that this is Babylon. The, the great city, you know that this is that that's what this is, but I'm going to give you some of the details as to this city and what's going on here. So looking at some of the microcosm, <clears throat> we see that the beast that is Babylon, rep, uh, kind of represented here, personified in this woman, this great harlot, is riding on. And we have seven heads. This beast particularly has seven heads. And on these seven heads are ten horns of this beast. Okay. So we see here, looking at the first seven verses of this particular text, all of the details, at least up to this point, are given to us, and the angelic messenger is going to inform John on the details of each of these things that he sees before him. First, the seven heads and the ten horns, specifically, okay? as well as uh, some of the details of the harlot. You know, again, this is good news for us who are kind of reading this, right? Because again, we don't have to guess what the details are. You know, we don't have to go, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's this, maybe it's this, maybe this reflects this, maybe it's symbolic of this. We don't have to figure out ourselves what this imagery means. This makes it incredibly simple in some, to some degree because the details that the messenger is giving to John, John is kind of, you know, he's he's writing down and uh, he's giving them to us. Furthermore, we know also that all of the details that the angel is going to give to John are related in some way to the city of Babylon. Babylon is the center of these two chapters, 17 and 18. We must not forget this, okay? This is going to make things incredibly easy for us to understand if we keep Babylon the center of, the, of chapter 17 and 18, okay? Thirdly, just from considering all the details and the aspect of this book up to this point, remember the aspect really in some respects is not John. The aspect is going to be from the messenger. John is just writing this down from the view of the messenger. Okay? This book is discussing Babylon and all of the details the messenger will outline, okay? This will make it, again, incredibly easy for us to look at details if we keep Babylon the center of chapter 17 specifically, since we're in it, and 18, okay? So, again, who is the great harlot? Well, the great harlot, from a plain reading of the text, especially from verse 5, is Babylon, Babylon the Great, right? This Babylon the Great is the city this great city it seems will have great power and influence and this great city will be the central hub and focus of all of the activity that is against god 
and his word. The kings of the earth will be, it seems, will be influenced by this, and those who dwell on the earth will be captivated by this particular city. Okay. Again, why is this chapter here in this part of the historical account? Well, the images represent the aspect of time where one of the angels who poured out one of the seven calamities will outline specifically the destiny and the judgment, even some of the history of Babylon. That is the macrocosm, right? So with that being said, we will continue next week. Yes, we will continue next week. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we will we will uh, we will close out here. Lord, thank you that we don't really have to um, think too hard about these details. That doesn't mean that the details aren't difficult uh, to understand or challenging, really. But we do have insight into some of these details if we just read and kind of take a look and, and kind of smell the roses a little bit. I thank you so much for John's account and him writing to us concerning the messenger and what this messenger has to say concerning this particular time in history. We thank you so much, Lord, for who you are, that we continue, Lord, to be informed um, about your word and be encouraged by it. And we thank you so much for it's in your son's name.